Good morning. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Monroe County Board of Commissioners. I will note that uh, Commissioner Gissens and I are present here in the Nat U Hill Room. Commissioner Jones is absent today. We want to congratulate her and her family on the arrival of Commissioner Jones's new granddaughter. Very exciting. Uh, we'll begin with our public statement. We, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, renew our commitment to welcome and protect the rights of all people, regardless of age, race, color, creed, disability, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, marital status, economic status, and national origin. And we affirm the right of every person to live peacefully and without fear, and we will fight and resist at every step discrimination and harmful policies, whatever their source. We also stand in support of our county public school systems, both RBB and MCCSC. And with that, we have, I wish to make a motion to add two items to our agenda. First will be item E, which is um, a memorandum of understanding with Purdue Union Extension here in town. And the second is item F, authorization for uh, septic contracts. I will second that. Uh, all in favor of amending the agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 2-0. Uh, we will now move on to our department updates. We'll begin with the health department, Ms. Kelly. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Wastewater concentrations of COVID have continued to increase as of August 28th. We have seen a small increase in emergency room visits for COVID-like illness as well. The Futures Family Planning Services are being transferred to the Indiana Family Health Council. They can be reached at 317-363-8613. The Health Department is still offering STI and HIV testing, treatment, counseling, and referral services. You can call 812-349-2829 for more information about those services. And um, we have received COVID-19 vaccines for those who are insured, and we are expecting uh, shipments for uninsured adults and children later this week. All right, thank you so much. Comments or questions, Commissioner Githens? Uh, no questions, but I did notice, I have started receiving notices that um, both flu and COVID vaccines are available. So yeah. it's out in the public. All right, thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. All right, uh, next we have um, some information from DLZ. I don't know if uh, Scott Carnegie is, he is online. If you could um, thank you for the, um, image, if you could promote Scott Carnegie as well. Uh, we also have Eric Ratz here from DLZ. And I don't know who wants to start. Scott? Good okay. morning, Commissioners. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure can. Thank you for joining us. All right, good morning. Um, wanted to present uh, the image that you see um, there on the screen on the monitor. Uh, in particular, DLZ was requested to do a site assessment analysis on three different parcels uh, in, as it relates to the possible site for a new sheriff's office and jail slash justice center. Uh, those three sites, as you can see there, they're off of Vernal Pike, uh, just east of the intersection of Curry Pike and, and Vernal Pike there. The three sites, starting with the site furthest to the west or to the left, uh, that is a 14-acre site that's currently zoned PUD. The center site is a total of 46 acres. It also is zoned PUD. And then the site furthest to the east or the right, uh, it's actually, there's two different zoning designations for that parcel. The northern partial is uh, zoned estate residential one and the southern half is zoned light industrial, and it's a total of 53 acres. Uh, sticking with the zoning, um, if you look at the site, the, the sites that surround these three uh, sites, you can see over off of Curry Pike, uh, there are some um, 
kind of fat factory warehouses there. I think we're all probably probably familiar with this location that zoned PUD. Continuing in the clockwise direction up around Stouts Creek, you see a state residential one, lots of backup to the northern uh, property line of the contemplated sites. Continuing on around clockwise off of Woodyard, you also see a state residential one uh, zoning. And continuing then on around um, to the south, uh, there's also a single dwelling residential of 3.5 and then multi-dwelling unit uh, residential. Um, so there's that mobile home park over to the kind of the southwest uh, corner. Also want to point out that the there is a park. It's currently um, owned um, there by um, Monroe County. Um, it's the Will Detmer Park. Um, I just want to point out to commissioners, I just noticed this is the incorrect um, image, this is the 15% slope. I don't know if the other image with the 25% is available. There you go. All right, perfect, thank you. So uh, all the information that I just spoke about, it's still accurate and correct, um, but just wanted to make sure that that was noted. Um, looking at the uh, sites then also, um, uh, looking at the key legend in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the yellow designates the, uh, the the approximate property lines of the three different parcels. And then the red stars, you can see there's, we've identified three different opportunities for access to these sites, two of which are off of Bernal Pike. One would access the, uh, the middle or the center uh, parcel. And then there's another access for the parcel to the right or to the east. Um, off of uh, Vernal Pike as well. There's also an opportunity to access that particular site off of Woodyard Road. Um, if you look at the wetland designation and the key legend, there's none identified uh, on this drawing because none exists. So we wanted to be consistent with the legend information uh, that we discussed on the other properties uh, that we were asked to do a site assessment on previously. So we wanted to be sure to include the same site elements on this uh, assessment as well. And then you can see the waterway designation in the legend. You can see Stout Creek kind of meanders um, over along the northwest, kind of clips that far uh, northwestern parcel. Um, and then I'm going to come back to the 25% slope. That's the red designation. Um, but you can see also potential car sinkhole areas. There's none identified uh, within these three parcels. That doesn't necessarily mean that none exist. There would really, we need to have uh, an environmental, you know, through vet engineering, similar to what they've done on the other sites to um, assess these sites, just to make sure there's no other uh, potential car sinkhole areas. But then if you look at the red dots, uh, those are recorded car sinkhole spring locations. There are two recorded on these sites. One is recorded over on the far west parcel, and then one over in, uh, kind of in the center of the parcel uh, furthest to the right or the east. Uh, similar to the, uh, the wetlands area in that it was talking about the bus route, there is no bus route um, on that accesses these sites, but we wanted to uh, make sure that we designated that in the key legend and point out that there's no bus route to these sites. Uh, there is gas um, that would access, uh, be available for these sites along Vernal Pike. Uh, sanitary is also available. However, it would need to be upsized according to our preliminary calculations. Uh, for a full build out of 500 plus future expansion as well as a justice facility. It's currently an eight inch sanitary and preliminary calculations indicate that a 12 inch sanitary would be required. Uh, water is also available uh, for the site there along Vernal Pike. And you can see the electric miscellaneous utility in kind of the purple. Uh, one thing I wanna make sure that you all see is running in the north south or the up down direction between the second and the third parcels. Uh, there is a power line that runs through there, but power is available along Vernal Pike and Curry Pike. Now, Ber Vernal Pike has a 2.5 megawatt um, capacity. 
and Curry Pike has a five megawatt. Again, in our preliminary calculations, similar to the sanitary, um, we would need the five megawatt for a full build out. And so that would have to come off of Curry Pike and it's assumed as some kind of an easement crossing um, those properties to access um, these three potential sites would be required. And then you can see there in the notes down below the legend, uh, most of this I've already discussed, but the sanitary line being eight inch, 12 inch required. And I just spoke about the power supply extended from Curry Pike. Uh, fiber is not currently available at the site and preliminary um, estimates to extend fiber to the site is approximately $65,000. Now, I want to go back to the areas shaded in red. Uh, I intentionally kind of skipped over those. Uh, those are the areas that are 25% slope or greater. That's a recent state code update, and I believe the county just very, very recently updated um, your information as well. Um, those are the areas that we are not um, allowed to uh, develop uh, in any way. And if you look at uh, the site over to the left, um, furthest to the west, you heard me say that that was a total of 14 acres. If you subtract the red area, that is 25% slope or greater, that will yield us nine acres buildable approximately for the parcel furthest to the west. The center lot, uh, you heard me previously indicate that that was a total of 46 acres. If you subtract the red areas, again, 25% slope or greater, that will yield us approximately 35 acres buildable. If you look over to the site furthest to the right or the east, you previously heard me say that that was a total of 53 acres, and that will yield us 36 acres buildable by the time that you take out the area shaded in red. Now, when I say buildable, if you look at this, it's pretty evident that the red areas are kind of meandering all over the place. Um, so there's no large contiguous, uh, you know, when I say there's 36 acres or 35 acres buildable, um, you have to dance around uh, those areas shaded in red. So is it possible? Uh, for the sheriff's office and jail to be constructed here in conjunction with a justice center. Yes, technically it's feasible. There is enough acreage, but the design would be very fragmented, um, kind of disjointed. Uh, we'd have to really kind of work and massage the building uh, footprints, uh, the design to um, accommodate these sites. Now, there's also, you can see furthest to the south, there's along the north side of Bernal Pike, uh, there's some estate residential properties there as well. Uh, I think I skipped over those previously. I just want to point those out. Are there any questions? Huh. Oh, there we go. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Carney. Um, questions or comments, Commissioner Githens? Um, it's a, more of a comment at this point, because of the hiatus on um, extending sewer, we do not know if we can get sewer hookup here from the city of Bloomington Utilities. And I, I'm at a point in my thinking that I don't want additional delays related to anything. Um, and hearing also that, that it would take upgrades to the power and to the sewer and things for fiber. Um, this sounds like we're building in delays with this, so. Yeah, um, I appreciate the information and um, this is really useful to see. Um, so the, the white footprint is from, is reflects the Hamilton County facility as it is now, correct? That is correct, and that's an excellent point. Um, yes, that is the Hamilton County jail footprint. The reason that we chose that is to just to be consistent from all the other properties that you know we performed a site analysis on several months ago. 
uh, we used Hamilton County because I think most people were familiar with the Hamilton County facility. So we just tried to be consistent uh, with the previous studies. Okay, so that would be a sheriff's office and jail footprint, and then we don't have court services and we don't have a parking lot. And so ostensibly, those the center lot and the eastward lot, the one on the right where people are looking, could be utilized for the buildings, but they would be separated by quite a distance in space. Potentially, potentially yes, or you go vertical, which I know that the Monroe County's current uh, justice facility is vertical and it's not favored being vertically right. designed. Right, okay, great. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Um, and um, we have uh, Corey Grass here, who's the um, transition leader for uh, the jail. I, I don't know if you wanna add anything. If I could, I appreciate it. And again, yeah, I'm Corey Grass, the jail transition team director for the sheriff. Uh, I was had uh, some bullet points to talk about of why time was of the essence and the delays we would have with other issues, but I think when Mr. Carnegie mentioned dancing around to get th certain things done, that kind of summarizes a lot of what I was talking about. We don't need to dance around at North Park. Uh, Commissioner Gibbons mentioned as well, you know, the delays on some utilities and things. We don't have to wait on Duke utilities. We don't have to wait on city approval or anything for North Park. All big pluses. Uh, the sheriff and I had discussed the last couple of weeks that, you know, time is of the essence. We keep, keep reminding you that every day in this current facility, we're one day closer to a catastrophic failure, <clears throat> excuse me, catastrophic failure where the elevator's not gonna work, the boiler's gonna go out in the middle of the winter and they'll have no heat, no hot water. So uh, those things all feed into why I think, again, North Park's gonna be the best bet for us for the sheriff's office and or jail. Uh, it's also a justice complex. Uh, the sheriff's office would be in a much better location as well to respond to, to calls all throughout the county. It's a direct route to the hospital. It's uh, for prisoner transports that we do have to make to other facilities. You know, we have Interstate 69 and Highway 46. Um, I think from talking to DLZ, which we do daily, uh, sometimes way too long for Mr. Carnegie with me. Uh, conservatively, we still think, very conservatively, each month that we're not moving forward costs us at least $500,000 on the back end in inflationary costs at a minimum. So again, I just strongly support the North Park location. I think it's best for the Sheriff's Office. We don't have utility issues. We don't have to deal with other people's approvals, other people to complete the work for us. The survey's already been started up there by DLZ recently, so I think that's it's the ideal spot for us to move the sheriff's office and the jail. All right, thank you so much. Do you have any comments or questions for Mr. Grass? This isn't for Mr. Grass, but as a lot of people know, I like to play with numbers. Um, and if we were to go explore this even more, we would have to have a phase one and five, phase two environmental. We'd have to have a geologic survey done. We'd have to have the, the survey done that um, DLZ is doing right now on North Park. Those would take we started our process for looking at North Park with some of this stuff in March. March 13th, we signed the first contract for, the, I think, the phase one. So it, it would push it out probably another six months. It would add another 125 dollars to $150,000 to get this additional work done. And so, again, time is money at this point, and I'm, I really hope we can move forward. And I would add, the time is money, and obviously money is important to all of us, for the county and us personally, but there's also a cost with the failing facility. Someone's going to get hurt, someone's going to get killed, staff morale, lack of visitation, lack of programming, all the things we've discussed for the past, well, at least six or eight months, but I'd say years, <laughs> this has been discussed. So again, it's just, it's the best, fastest route to get where we need to be to better serve. Great. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, too. I appreciate that. Thank you, Scott. Um, and uh, we also, speaking of North Park, we have uh, Sarah here from Vet uh, Environmental. I wonder if you have anything you want to offer. If I could make a, just a couple of quick comments. Sure. Uh, one is we have reached out to the CBU for sewer on that. We're trying to figure out if it is technically feasible for the flow as we've estimated by DLZ. Um, so that is something the staff has been working on. And I would say, you know, I invited Sarah from VET here because we just received the phase two. There's an item on your agenda with the archeological item. And I, 
I assume that you have lots of questions on that, and I assume that she is the best person to answer that question, so I thought maybe we would just take a little bit of time for her to, to kind of explain some of the, what she found, if anything, on the, on the North Park site and do it all as, so everybody here who's listening to the jail site information has it all at one place. Right, instead of waiting until it comes yes. up on our agenda. Got it, thank you. Thank you so much for being here, we appreciate it. Thanks for right. having me. Do you just want me to run through all Please. the things? What? Yes, tell us all about it. Okay, so the Cliffs Note <laughs> version is that Stout Creek runs through the site and that is a historic known location of low level PCB contamination coming out of the Bennett Stump site. And so when we did the phase one, our only recognized environmental condition was to evaluate the floodplain that extends very near the North Park boundary. That would be the South North Park boundary to determine whether floodwaters that proceed onto the site may have caused low level PCB contamination historically or ongoing. Um, so that prompted the phase two investigation. Uh, we did soil sampling to that effect. Uh, we advanced six soil borings right along the kind of the flood plain and property boundary line, which is just to the south, kind of on and south of that property boundary for North Park. Um, there were two locations with very low level PCB contamination. There was one location that had some arsenic contamination, but that's just Monroe County. Um, so from a environmental contamination standpoint, we don't see any that is of import or anything that you would have to remediate for or anything like that. Um, in addition to the phase one, phase two, we did a wetland and jurisdictional waters delineation. Uh, we did not identify any wetlands. We think that there are a fair number of wetlands just south of the property, but not on the property. Um, we did find two jurisdictional streams on the upper portion of North Park, um, and they're pretty clear ditches that are there for conveyance of stormwater. Those two streams make a confluence, run downhill into the retention pond, and then proceed offsite to Stout Creek. In addition to that, uh, we commissioned a karst assessment. There were three sinkholes identified. They're small. Um, they would need a 25-foot sinkhole conservation easement that is in um, the county ordinance. I have that it's, map. It's now 50 feet. Oh, for the smaller ones too? It would need a 50 foot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That's, that's been revised very recently. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't blame you for not knowing yeah, that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I don't know if you have. Would you like to see this? Sure. If, if um, thank you. That's the location of the three sinkholes. Um, then the archaeological. Um, there were archaeological sites that had been recorded on the property that were not identified, which means they've already been taken away somehow or another. There were a couple of archaeological sites that are not recorded that were identified on the site. And based on what our subcontractor is saying, those sites need to be recorded with the DNR, the DHPA. And once that is done, they do not believe that the sites are anything that will prevent development or impede your ability to develop these areas, but they have to be recorded in order for them to do their kind of due diligence and take their report through to completion. Okay. And so that is what we have the change order um, in front of you for, okay. is that piece. To, re um, to record it. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And then once that's done and they've gone through the DHPA process, they'll give us our final report and we can get that to you guys. Um, additionally, we did um, initial consultation with Fish and Wildlife and the DNR to ensure that you're not going to have any issues with endangered species or protected things there. Um, the only thing that we're kind of discussing with them right now is how much tree clearance is going to take place. What we're hoping to accomplish with them is um, get you approval to do up to all trees on the site with the understanding that there will be some vegetative recovery, some re replanting, things of that nature that happen. But that way it won't, if you choose to keep some of the trees, that's great, but you don't necessarily have to. And so we're kind of doing the dance with them about that right now. Got it. So those are the only two outstanding things are the archeological and then the the negotiations, negotiations with Fish and Wildlife for that permitting. Okay, great. Let's see if um, Commissioner Githens has any comments or questions. I just want to share with uh, our residents that Ms. Mitovich is a local person and you have a vested interest in making sure that this is done right because you are a resident here also. And Sorry. I really appreciate that. That's uh, a great point. 
So, yeah. yes. No, that's a great point. Um, and um, so my question is this um, um, historic preservation report, DHPA and DNR, um, obviously we can't do anything on the property until that's completed and through that pro how, approximately, I won't hold you to this, approximately how long does this take? So I don't know that it's accurate that you can't do anything on the property. I would say you can't do anything in that direct area, which actually is kind of probably out of the beaten path where you're not even going to be doing things it, initially. It really is off on the side. Right. And so I think we could yeah. do an avoidance minimization thing at least initially while that process is ongoing. Um, my understanding, though, is they just need um, the approval to proceed and then um, the I think they've already made contact with DHPA, so we're just waiting for that final receipt back. I can get you an answer on exactly how long they anticipate as soon as we give them the go-ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. You're That's very great. welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Good, good. All right. If I could ask a question, and because I, I think it's important to put in context that we've used the same vendor for all these properties that we've looked at. And so the first question I asked her is, how does the North Park site as a whole, as a building site, compare to the other ones we've looked at? When we looked at Fullerton, we looked at Thompson. So I think that is a, I, I know the answer, so I, that's, but that is, but that is. <laughs> a the, good lawyer always knows the answer before but, they but, ask but the question. But I think that's the public to know, right? Because yeah. I was a little that's, surprised with, with the response. Yeah. Do you want me to give my response again? <laughs> how, yes, how does this compare to the other sites you so, looked at for this project? Um, Fullerton had a large number of waters and wetlands that were kind of patchworked through the whole property um, that made it challenging. Also, I have never experienced insects <laughs> like I did at Fullerton, but that's just a side note. Um, Rockport um, was tricky too. There was wa waters and wetlands there and the utility, the power lines, and it was just very segmented. Um, from an environmental contamination standpoint, I think they're all comparable. We didn't find anything hugely problematic at any of the sites with respect to contamination, but North Park just seems like the largest swath of uninterrupted acreage that doesn't have, from an environmental standpoint, does not have obstacles to development. So that's, I, if it were me, I think North Park is the best. Yeah, great, thank you. And I would just note that Rockport, we refer to that as the Thompson site. Ah, very good, right. okay. Yes, got it, okay. Thompson site. I was thinking about that little tiny Rockport piece we looked at one, at one point. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's great, thank you so much. Um, did anybody um, else want to make a comment about um, Jail sighting from the sheriff's department or a jail commander? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, we have another department update from Mr. Cockrell. Yes, and, and I'm making this as from the legal department as well as we've been working with the auditor's office and the health environmental specialists, which are the septic ins inspectors at the our health department. We have on our website, as of this morning, a ARPA septic program request application. Uh, you can find it by going under hot news or new business. I, I've already passed that, but it's the, you know, the, the hot news part of the thing. And it's a seven question application. Um, it's essentially name, address, phone number, email address, um, reason for your request, you check a box, it's either your septic system is either 35 plus years old or it's you suspect it's failing. If you suspect it's failing, the next question is why do you think it's failing? And then the final question is if you are, on a, if, if you are assisting someone else in doing this, please put your contact information so we have someone to contact. Um, so that, those are the questions that are on the application. I will say that we're, th this is open to people who live outside the city limits who have a homestead on their property, and the assessed value of the property um, for 2023 was $300,000 or less. Um, our anticipation is that, that the county would support 100% of the septic replacement cost, um, including any soil sampling to determine where it needs to go, up to $40,000 for anybody who 
complies with those standards. So that, so if you, if, if people are home and they think, hey, I, I, my septic system's failing or I've lived here for 40 years and I haven't upgraded it and we chose 35 because 45 is essentially the useful life and so we wanted to make sure we caught that issue before it actually failed. Um, they should go to our website and fill out this. It will go to our septic, septic inspectors, our health environmental specialists, and that they first come, first serve application. If you qualify, you qualify, and there's more to the process, but I think right now we'd like to get the applications. You know, our funding will probably allow us to do up to 40 to 50 different septic systems, septic full replacement. So if you think you have it, I would tell you not to wait around because it is a first come, first serve basis. Right. Thank you, and item F will be a further discussion of mm -hmm. this. Yes. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, any other um, department have an update for us? We really appreciate everybody sharing all this information this morning. It's really useful. Okay, I don't see any. Uh, so we move on. We have um, a couple of proclamations. Uh, the first one is a proclamation for uh, Hunger Action Month, uh, whereas access to nutritious food is not only necessary for healthy human development and productivity, it is also a basic human right. Studies show that one in seven Hoosiers and one in five Indiana children are food insecure, including over 21,000 residents in Monroe County. Hoosier Hills Food Bank works to reduce hunger and food insecurity by collecting and distributing over 5.2 million pounds of food annually through a network of programs and partner agencies. Hoosier Hills Food Bank works in partnership with Feeding America to create awareness of hunger by encouraging residents to donate, advocate, and volunteer. And Monroe County government has consistently supported the efforts of Hoosier Hills Food Bank and many other local nonprofits to combat hunger and food insecurity. September is nationally recognized as Hunger Action Month. We, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim that September is Hunger Action Month in Monroe County, Indiana, and we encourage all county residents to support the efforts of local hunger relief organizations by donating, advocating, and volunteering. And we will have the courthouse lit in orange in honor of this uh, Hunger Action Month from September 9th through September 13th. This is proclaimed the fourth day of December 2024 by the Monroe County Board of Commissioners. And we're wearing our shirts. We're wearing our new shirts, yes. <laughs> and I would like to point out that um, there is a barrel down in the courthouse rotunda so that people can donate food that will go to help feeding those in our community who are in need of that. So um, there's already some stuff in the barrel, and I encourage others to make a difference also. So the second proclamation is for Recovery Month. Whereas Recovery Month is a national observance held every September to inform Americans that evidence-based treatment and services can enable those with mental health and substance use disorders to live healthy and rewarding lives. Now in its 35th year, Recovery Month celebrates the gains made by those living in recovery. It also honors the tireless work of recovery providers who work so hard to make a difference in their communities. Employment can play a, can play a key role in recovery and supported employment services offer new gateways to empowerment and recovery for people across the United States. Medication assisted treatment, or MAT, is effective and can be integrated into both treatment and support settings to help people in their recovery. MAT services can be integrated into clinical settings, the criminal justice system, recovery housing, and peer recovery support programs. Monroe County takes great pride in being a member of the Stride Coalition and providing the space for the Stride Center, an alternative to incarceration for those in crisis. Recovery Month celebrates the gains made by those in recovery, just as we celebrate improvements made by those who are managing other health conditions, such as hypertension, diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. As part of our support for those in recovery, this year we are hosting Paint the Town Purple on Friday, September the 20th, from 5 to 7 p.m. here on our own courthouse lawn. Recovery is different for each person. 
For some it is abstinence, for some it is harm reduction, for some it is counseling, and for others it is following a medical regimen. No matter what path one takes, recovery is the process of taking back control. We seek to end the stigma attached to mental health challenges and substance use disorders with the goal of making it easier for people to come forward when they are ready. We firmly believe that recovery is possible for everyone, every person, every family, and every community. Now, therefore, we, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, proclaim September 2024 as Recovery Month in Monroe County, proclaim this fourth day of September 2024. And I would also like to say that tomorrow is our recovery summit. It's held at the Monroe County Convention Center. We have some amazing speakers, including individuals who are in recovery, I will be on panels. And um, if, you, if you wish, I believe, maybe you can still sign up. I'm not sure because of the food issues, but um, we're looking forward to this. I think at this point, we have close to 200 people registered. So that feels good. Good. Thank you for all your hard work on that. And thank you to the Substance Use Disorder Committee um, for their work on this uh, as well. Uh, making this happen, it's, it's an important thing. Um, all right, um, so next on our agenda is um, public comment. This is uh, public comment for items not already on the agenda. We limit public comment to three minutes per speaker. We ask people to provide their name and their county of residence. Uh, if you could raise your hand, you could get promoted uh, to present. I do not. You may come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Yes. Sorry. First, so then I went to the teams, and then I just blew it. I'm not so, used to this. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Clint Deck from Purdue Extension, and we have Audie Ekwanwa and Kip Harmon. And I guess we could have squeezed in on uh, department updates, but uh, we'll do it That's this okay. way. That's great. Because we weren't on the agenda. So uh, we just wanted to do a quick quarterly update. Uh, this is a good time of year to talk about uh, everything that has happened over our busy summer with Purdue Extension programming. Uh, and it's also a good time of year to update you because uh, the new uh, upgraded contractual services that provide for a second 4-H educator have kicked in and we have officially hired our new 4-H educator so that's very exciting and, and Kip will introduce himself in just a second uh, but just a few quick highlights from four different program areas um, we have uh, HHS which is health and human sciences and that would be Audie and uh, Audie is a very busy person. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> she, she works on so many different community committees and is making big change happen in the community. Um, a few things from this past summer that were very successful were the Matter of Balance program, uh, helping older adults with fall prevention and increased physical activity, summer camp at the Banneker Center, uh, many things in conjunction with the fair board and the open class and the um, extension homemakers and all the things that go into um, exposition over the summer. Uh, and then also she had an Empower Me series uh, focusing on clutter. Uh, another great thing we have in Purdue Extension is a regional um, expert dealing with community wellness. And Annie Aiken has done a great job working with the e-farmers market program, uh, the Monroe County Health Equity Council, and then working with uh, groups in the community to conduct the three-year Monroe County Health Needs Assessment. Uh, Edward Ullman is our Ag and Natural Resources Educator, and the only reason he's not here is because his baby girl is arriving this morning. Mm. So that's exciting. Uh, <laughs> And he is a, he's great, you know, working with planning commission and other uh, boards in the community. Uh, he is currently working with a master naturalist program, master gardening, and um, doing some very innovative trainings with unmanned aerial vehicles, helping people to get certified with their pilot's license for uh, drones. You know, starting their own businesses with drones, working with electric companies and drones, agriculture and drones. 
So that's super exciting. And then comes 4-H. 4-H is thousands of things all rolled into one. And we are going to pass out a folder so you can read <laughs> about our summer and all of the kids and everything that they've done over the summer. Uh, so there's, there's three packets. And we also have some extra copies for anybody else who wants to read about the fair results and our summer camps and all the other things we've done. So I won't get into a lot of that so that we stay under three minutes. We're no, it's, that's over. okay. You, you can go beyond. It's, I'm considering this like a department update, so <laughs> okay. that's okay. Yeah. Timer's off. Okay. Uh, so anyway, 4-H, uh, uh, we're so lucky in this county to have so much support uh, from county government, from Purdue, uh, from just everybody in the community. There's such a rich tradition here. Uh, I'm a product of Jeff Your Holland, who was here for 30 years. I, I, I was one of his 4-H'ers. So uh, I just want us to continue innovating, continue growing the program. And I'm so excited now that we can have two educators focusing on different components of the community. We will be in all of the schools this year doing different types of robotics programming, team mm -hmm. building exercises, uh, really anything that the teachers may need help with. Uh, we can help develop new research-backed programming to come in and do in the schools. And that doesn't take into account all the other fairs, festivals, and community events that we try to be at. Uh, we are the primary organizer for the largest field trip in the county, which is the Children's Farm Festival at Peden Farm. And we're excited for that to come up later this month. Uh, we will see over 5,000 people at that event for pre-K through first grade youth. Wow. And every year we are adapting that to be more research driven, uh, to really help with that developmental stage and to really make that a memorable educational experience for all of those youth. I think every kid in the county gets to go on that field trip. So mm -hmm. we're very excited about that. So without further ado, I will introduce Kip Harmon to just a few words about him and what brought him to Monroe County. Great, thank you. Good morning. Kip Harmon, um, first thank you for approving the position. I appreciate the, the support for the count of the county. Um, I'm a 31-year educator, uh, public educator from Texas. Um, I have spent uh, so many years as a social studies teacher but also an administrator um, and uh, after that time it looked like it was something a new, new version, new time to do something different and um, uh, this opportunity arose as well as my youngest son coming to Purdue uh, starting in January at the College of Ag. Um, and so it's just an opportunity to, to come do something different and um, I really appreciate the opportunity that Purdue has, has offered me um, and I look forward to continuing to work with, uh, with Clint and, and Audie and get to know this community and the county a lot better. Um, and we appreciate so far the warm welcome that I've received, so Great. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any uh, chance of getting the, um, what's called the Citizens Academy back? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, we, th the timing didn't work out this year uh, because of the election and, and some different things. So we're trying to figure out if, uh, we've talked about in our needs assessment that's going out soon, if we can pull everybody who may be interested to see if, a spring version works because in the, in the past a fall version was like the only thing that departments acted like would work. So if we can figure out a way that a spring version would work, we can jump on that and get that into a yearly rotation starting this spring. Yeah, so, makes sense. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Well, that's good news. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, don't give up on it. It's a good program. <laughs> Any questions or? I just want to share with the public that Edward Ullman helped plant, I think it was 8,000 trees out at the uh, closed landfill. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's really good. And, and he was excited about yeah. it. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. sure. Right. Right. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you. All right, um, with that, we'll move on to our next item. Which... Anybody, any other public comments? No, I don't see any other hands raised. Move on to approval of minutes. Yes, I move approval of the minutes from August 26, 2024 and August 28, 2024. Second. Any comments, corrections, or edits? The one correction I had has already been made, so. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes for August 26th and August 28th, 2024, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 2-0. Next item, please. Move approval of the claims docket, accounts payable September 4th, 2024, and payroll September the 6th, 2024. I will second that, and we have Ms. Miller here to tell us all about it. Good morning. Good morning. The accounts payable claims docket for September 20. For September 4th, 2024, totals $2,346,591.43. This includes all emergency claims and adjustments. The payroll docket for September 6th, 2024, includes $1,561,774.68 in direct costs and the remaining $664,272.61 were for indirect costs for a grand total of $2,226,047.29. Great. Thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Giffens? This was a really light. <laughs> it <laughs> was, it was short. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. You can raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the claims docket accounts payable September 4th, 2024, and payroll September 6th, 2024, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 2-0. Uh, I will note for the record that we received a report from the treasurer for July 2024, and um, there's some handwritten numbers on the right-hand side. I talked to the treasurer, and she said just ignore those, so <laughs> we'll ignore them. All right, uh, on to new business, uh, please. Yes, I move approval of TK Elevator Core Service Agreement for Elevator Door Maintenance and Repairs at the Jail. Fund name 2022 GO Bond, fund number 4815. The amount is $10,496.98. I will second that. Mr. Kreider. Good morning, Commissioners. Richard Kreider, Facilities and Fleet. This request is to accept the proposal submitted by TK Elevator Corporation in the amount of $10,496.98 to repair the elevator clutch and to furnish and install car door rollers and relating sheaves on elevator doors to prevent future breakdowns related to the opening and closing mechanisms. Great. Thank you so much. Comments, questions? Commissioner Githens? This is just more of the upkeep that we're having to pay on this facility, yep. and it, it just keeps happening yeah. um, every, every month. I'm, I'm just grateful it's only $10,500. <coughs> That's all I can say. So thank you for your attention to this. Yes. Yeah. Any public comment on this item? You can raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the TK Elevator Corp Service Agreement for the elevator door maintenance and repairs at the jail, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 2-0. Next item, please. Move approval of contract with Tony Newton doing business as commercial cleaning services. This is an amendment, fund name, county general, fund number 1,000. The amount is a $500 increase, um, and I believe that that's an per month increase, is that right? Bi-weekly. Bi-weekly. We pay Mr. Newton bi-weekly. Uh, okay. Uh, it was an increase of $250. I, I will second that. Now go. Oh, okay. Sorry. Now. <laughs> Five hundred dollars on Line C Health Building, from two thousand six hundred and six dollars to three thousand one hundred and six. This will compensate for the addition of a daily cleaning routine in the health clinic space on the main level of the Monroe County Health Building. The annual contract amount will increase from $2,000, wait, $203,220 to $216,216 throughout the remainder of the five-year term signed in December of 2023. All right. Thank you. Comments or questions? Commissioner Giffens? But he's just cleaning additional space there. So. Right, yes. and it's medical space. So right. It's, you know, protocols are different. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, there are so many times that I've 
heard people comment about how neat and clean our buildings are. So really, he's, he's really good. So appreciate this. All right, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the contract amendment with Tony Newton doing business as commercial cleaning service signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 2-0. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Next item, please. We have approval of VET Environmental Engineering Phase Two Environmental Study for Hunter Valley Road, also known as North Park, for the potential jail site change order. Fund name, edit bond, fund number 4816, in an amount of $7,752.50. Second. Mr. Cockrell. Yes, and we discussed this earlier. This is the, we, we, there was a couple sites that were not designated or not on the registry and this is to get that information to the state so that they have that um, for that area i think it's an important thing to do and, um, is this being paid out of the the bond anticipation note it says edit bond it should be ban ban okay it should be the okay bond anticipation note yeah. okay we'll just say it was a a little Scrivener's error there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Comments or questions, Commissioner Githens? No. I, I think Ms. Minovich yeah. offered things earlier that really, made a difference. Really good information. Yes. Uh, I don't have any uh, comments or questions beyond what I just asked, so thank you for that. Um, and um, yes, Ms. Minovich is, is just on it, like it just things don't take long. So thank you so much for your timely attention to these I, issues. I, I don't know how she does it all because I, I wanted to congratulate her too but on her coaching yeah. that she coached a thrower who won state title. And yeah, just amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely really amazing. good. All right, uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the VET Environmental Engineering Phase Two Environmental Study for Hunter Valley Road, North Park Potential Jail Site Change Order, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 2-0. Next item, please. We have approval of Ordinance 2024-35 to amend Ordinance 86-06. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Ridge. Good morning. Um, this is to amend um, Ordinance 86-06 to delete the following stop locations, Garrison Chapel Road for a railroad crossing, Woodyard Road for a railroad crossing, and Elrin Runround for a railroad crossing. Garrison Chapel now has lights, and the other two locations were abandoned. Um, also, um, amending Ordinance 86-09 with, with a stop location, which is Griffith Cemetery Road for Thompson Ridge Road. The stop sign's actually been there, uh, just needed uh, an ordinance passed, and that was in conjunction with I-69 when it was built. Um, all of these items did go to the Monroe County Traffic Commission Board and was approved unanimously. All right. Thank you so much. Comments, questions? Commissioner Gibbons. Oh. I don't have any questions. You already addressed it. Thank you so much. Any public comment on this item? You can raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of approving Ordinance 2024-35, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries uh, 2-0. Uh, we now have our new item, item E. We have approval of the Memorandum of Understanding with Purdue Extension. Uh, this is to support families uh, through the probation department, I believe. We'll second that, Ms. Turner King. Ah, thank you. Oh, we have Patty back too. Yes. And we're back. Line to speak to the program that will be provided. 
However you'd like to do it, it's your show. Okay, I'm not sure she's there. So um, I can present some details and we also have Audie from the Purdue Extension Office who will be working with probation um, here to answer questions as well. So this MOU is a request um, from probation to uh, contract with Purdue Extension. It will be using J JDAI grant um, funds. The program that Purdue Extension will be providing is the Strengthening Families Program, which is for parents or caregivers and youth aged 10 to 14. The program is designed to support families in preventing substance abuse and other behavioral problems, strengthening parent, caregiver, and youth communication skills, increasing academic success, and preventing violence and aggressive behavior in the home at school. It's a seven week program, and it meets one time per week for two hours per session. Um, during the sessions, parents are taught how to clarify expectations based on child development, using appropriate discipline pr practices, managing strong emotions regarding their children, and using effective communications. Uh, after the educational segment, there's like breakout session, um, and then during the entire two hours, a meal is provided for the families, and in any family that has children younger than 10 who can't participate, there's a child care proponent. So the JDAI grant funds would go toward um, vouchers for child care providers, uh, mileage for the facilitators, and um, transportation assistance for participants. Where this stands right now is I do not have a finalized contract with Purdue University because Purdue, the extension office is an entity of Purdue University. Purdue has to approve the contract. They have the contract. They indicate it that it needs to go to a board for approval. Um, so I do not have a finalized agreement. What I have presented you is the draft agreement that was provided to Purdue. It has a lot of our standard language in it regarding liability insurance. Um, we usually put the confidential information clause in probation uh, contracts. Um, the only outstanding issue that I am unclear of is who is responsible for the child care. I think that since Purdue Extension is providing the individuals who are providing the care that Purdue would cover the liability insurance for the child care, I, Purdue hasn't said that yet. Um, so if there is an amendment to the contract, the only amendment I think there should be is to clarify that Purdue is uh, responsible for insurance for the child care and that they will provide proof of such. So I haven't heard back from Purdue yet, um, and I don't know when I will. But the thing is, this program is scheduled to begin on September 9th, and it's been advertised to the school systems. I'm not sure if we have people signed up for it yet, but so we kind of need to get something in place before the program begins. So in essence, I'd be asking you to approve this draft contract um, <laughs> with the potential amendment for insurance. Uh, and then if there are any other amendments, I would have to bring them back. It's an awkward situation. <laughs> Okay, if they're actually handing no vouchers, does that mean that the child care is not provided on site, that they're actually, somebody else is providing the child care off site? It is on site. So in essence, what would happen is if a family had a child who was younger than the age of participating, they would go on site, child care would be provided and our, our grant funds would be used to buy um, gift cards to pay the individuals who are providing the child care. Thank you. So that's the, so that's the amount of money, right, at the, on item four. Correct. The total amount of JDI grant funds that would be used is $1,728, with um, that being divided up between vouchers for the child care providers, mileage for facilitators, and transportation assistance for participants, mm -hmm. which the transportation assistance for participants um, is about $500. So it takes up the bulk of what our grant funds are, but there are, we do provide the child care vouchers. Um, so I know we have approved the JDAI grant as money receded in. Correct. But this would be? Using that money 
we this, would be giving that so to we, Purdue. So we would have to do a dollar amount in our motion. And a fund number as well. well. We, yeah. If we don't have a fund number, at least we know it's J yeah. JDAI. Right. So that's right. okay. Right? Is that right? Uh, I believe so. I think you'd have to have the fund that the contract's being paid out of. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to amend uh, the motion to include the cost of $1,728 uh, to be paid out of JDAI. I'll second that. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any comments on the motion? Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Natu Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of amending the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries to zero. Now we have an amended motion on the table. Please proceed. Anything else we need to know? Do, so I absolutely trust that you will make sure this is done right. So I'm not worried about, yeah. I mean. And both Audie and I have been in contact with Purdue. I was in contact with Purdue as early as this morning. I know they're working on it. Um, they in, it said they were, could probably get it to us by the end of the week before the program starts. <laughs> they just couldn't get to, us, to it before today's meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely trust that that's going to get done. Yes, I, I would be happy authorizing. Yeah, Ms. Turner yeah. King. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Conway, do you want to add anything? Welcome. Um, not necessarily. Again, I apologize for kind of the timeliness of everything, but we are, like Molly said, having in communication with them, so we will take care of the child care and the MOU. Um, the child care one is the one that we're working on right now. Um, I applied for a certificate of insurance, so I know everything will be okay, but we're still waiting to hear back from them. Sure. Yeah, it's no problem. It's a great program. Thank you for organizing everything. It's great. All right. Uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this contract. All right. Uh, seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of approving the MOU uh, slash contract with Purdue Extension for Strengthening Families Program for JDAI, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries to zero. That worked. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we have item F. Yes. yes. I move that we authorize um, Ms. Purdy, our oh, administrator. No. Nope. Our Mr. Mr. Cockrell. Mr. Cockrell? Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> to sign the contracts for the septic uh, program that we are putting in place. I will second that. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit more about it? Yes, and I think it's the same premise as what we're looking at our rural repair program where we have a staff member who signed it for a couple of reasons. One is to get it out uh, quicker, and two is it. Well, it's not exactly 100% private. It at least not announced at a public meeting, hey, this person is getting this. Uh, I would feel that a failed septic system may discourage people from, from actually utilizing the program if they knew that that information about their property would be out. So th those are the kind of the two reasons we're working with Baker Tilly to kind of make sure the language in the agreement complies with what we need for the ARPA program. So there will be some changes made to, the, to the, the copy I have in front of me right now. But it, it essentially, it, it indicates that, you know, the county's role in this is that we are paying for it. Um, and that we are going to, the, the health department and the, is going to still maintain their program of they go out and inspect it, they, they have to review their process whenever any septic is involved. So that's still part of it. But essentially our part is to pay for it and we're, we'll contract directly with the vendor but if the vendor has an error or something like that, warranty goes to the property owner, that dispute goes to the property owner, they will not come back and sue the county if the installation. So that's the, the big purpose for, for the agreement is to make sure that happens. It also has the people who are actually installing uh, the septic systems have to provide us all the information we need in order to make this work. So w, our normal claims document, W-9, I think if any vendor ha goes over, we're working on this with Baker Tilly still, if any vendor goes over that $50,000 magical mark for the federal government, we may have to require them to give us additional information. So that's kind of what's outlined in the agreement. It's gonna have the address and it's gonna have to have, it has to be in place by November 1, 2025. 
so we can get it obligated this year and it's completed by the end of next year. Technically, we could push it out another year, but it doesn't seem like there's any reason to. So let's let's right. get these things done. Right. And, and a lot of times with um, septic, I, they have to wait for a dry spell and, and there's just certain times of the year that are better than others. And I know we're at the window of one of them now, end of the window of one of them now, but, um, but, but it still can be mapped out, put in place, organized, purchased, and then waiting for that, right. you know, the right weather conditions as it were. Okay, great. Do you have comments or questions? Sorry. I'm just really proud of the fact that we're doing this program. I know. I know. And, and, you know, when we, we talk about housing, this is another way that we keep people housed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, this is a huge uh, source of pollutants in Monroe County. I know we're part of the Bean Blossom group. And that's one of the things we've talked about quite a bit is um, the problem of septics. And, um, but but this is this is going to make a big difference, and I know that we've already done a lot of work with this through uh, friends of Lake Monroe on our 529 grant around Lake Monroe specifically. But if somebody hasn't been able to utilize that program there, they can they're certainly welcome uh, to to uh, apply. Yes, Ms. Purdy, <laughs> jump you. in. Sorry, I can um, tell you wanted to. I do. I, I <laughs> want to kind of. Um, give a shout out to our township trustees because they're actually going to be assisting Good. Um, in this program as they had assisted the uh, rural repair program has ended as far as us ac accepting applications at this point in time. Mm -hmm. The intention on that program is that um, Community Foundation will be able to um, carry it on after this um, this year for, for the county. Um, but going back to the septic, I sent out an email to the township trustees and I had a, a number of responses of people who were extremely grateful that this is being made available to our residents. And, um, you know, they, they too may know of people who have a failing septic. And so they're going to be able to be able to reach out to, to people and help them um, kind of navigate, this one is going to be a more difficult navigation mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. the rural repair was. Um, mm -hmm. There's more permits and things involved. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think that we need to give a, a, a big hand. Yes. Hand out to our um, uh. township trustees who've been really instrumental in, in helping us be successful with these programs. Yeah, we love our trustees. Yeah, they're amazing. Great. They're amazing. They're our first contact, the most local form of government we have. And I would add, our health environmental specialists are yes. really taking on this on and you know yeah, they, that's you know, really good they're going to yep. be the key to this the trustees right. and the health environment are yeah. going to be the keys to the success of this program and it's very exciting to see them to see them be excited to uh to take part in it yeah no that's really great no thank you for that you're right that is that is a huge help from our health department um that is definitely a cornerstone of this as well um, I do have a question for you, Jeff, that just occurred to me as Ms. Purdy was talking. Um, is, is this also applicable for like a small rental, a rental house? In other words, it doesn't have to be owner occupied. Well, we're requiring them to have homestead exemption on the property that ah okay that, that got is it here. okay so we we, it, we, it's, we okay. are this is owner occupied got it good um, okay okay. Thank I, you. We would have loved I, to expand it beyond that, but the funding we think is only yeah. a hit 40 or 50, and I, we, we think yeah. we prioritize home, owner occupied. Yeah, because no, of that it. makes sense. Um, appreciate that. I'm sorry I missed that before. You probably said it, and I missed it. I'm sorry. Well, I, I said it during the department update portion right. of this. No. So it, it's no, that was in a while. That was three days ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. There, there is a real problem with failing septic also around Lake, Lake Lemon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, when they do E. coli sampling out there, sometimes they list it as TNC, too numerous to count. And when they did some testing on the source of it, about half of that comes from human septic systems. So, yeah. Huge problem. It is. All right. Um, we don't have any other items. We don't have any appointments. <laughs> oh, we got it. Oh, we have still to vote on this. Oh, yes. Uh, all those in favor of another day goes by here. Another, all those approving uh, uh, 
uh, who approve uh, Jeff Cockrell as the signatory on ARPA septic contracts, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 2-0. Now we can move on. No appointments. Lots of announcements. Do you want to talk about recovery and paint the town? Thank you. Um, yes, again, tomorrow is the recovery summit at the uh, convention center. We will be starting promptly at 8.45. Doors open around 7.30. There will be uh, light snacks and lunch served as part of this as well. Forgot to say that earlier. And there, I think, is still an application available through our website, the co.monroe.in.us. And again, we'll be uh, sponsoring Paint the Town Purple on Friday, September the 20th this year here at the Courthouse Lawn. Uh, we'll have games, we'll have light snacks, we'll have, uh, again, um, Darren Mosley has agreed to be the DJ. Um, he has a great playlist for this. Um, so I encourage people to, to come out. In the years I've been associated with this, it has grown every single year. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and that starts at 5 p.m. 5 p.m., yeah. I think it was last year or the year before. A couple was walking past. They were in town, I think, for the IU football game or something like that, and they stopped, they chatted, and they said, wow, we wish we had something like this in our t hometown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll be decked out in purple for that event. Uh, thank you so much. And again, thank you for all your work on the commission that, that does all this and helps put this together, and um, it's, it's amazing to see it all. Well, and, and our prosecutor has been critical in planning the summit. The people in our health department have been working on both of these items. Um, the amazing team, absolutely amazing team. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, so um, do you want to remind everyone that uh, the Hoosier Hills Food Bank has uh, placed a food barrel at the uh, atrium of the, of the courthouse, um, and so we ask, um, uh, residents to uh, kindly donate uh, food for the cause. Uh, no glass, please, and make sure the food's not expired. Um, so cans are best. Uh, packaged pastas, yep. dried goods are yes. good. Yep, those are good. Um, uh, we last, a week ago, Monday, we went to uh, Steinsville and um, had a discussion with some Bean Blossom residents about the potential of joining the fire district. It was a really uh, interesting discussion. Lots of questions were raised. That, those answers, the answers to those questions are available um, on our homepage uh, under the um, recent news link. Uh, in addition, uh, as Mr. Cockrell pointed out, there's information there about applying uh, for um, assistance in septic replacement. Uh, that's also available from our homepage. And while you're there, click on that megaphone on our homepage at co.monroe.in.us and sign up for weather alerts, uh, health alerts, other emergency alerts. Uh, they can come straight to your phone in text, and call or email or all of the above. Um, so COVID-19 vaccines will be available soon uh, at our county public health clinic. Uh, COVID-19 tests are available, I believe, still at the Monroe County Health Department, 119 West 7th Street. We are accepting applications for all boards and commissions. It is, after all, now September, and we're getting to that point in the year where we really need to get a lot of those applications in. Uh, we are especially interested because we have a vacancy on the Redevelopment Commission, so if you're interested, um, please apply at co.monroe.in.us. Uh, we do continue to hold office hours via Teams six times each month. Go to the calendar on our homepage and uh, click on the meeting to join. Um, and blood drives uh, continue Thursday, September 5th, 1 to 6, Friday, September 6th, 10 to 3. Those are at Ivy Tech. Please go to redcross.org to make an appointment or they will help you out once you arrive, I'm sure. Um, so we still continue to offer the rural housing repair. No? No. We That's have, done. We have stopped accepting applications. However, ah. those that have been received um, are still in process. So um, if okay. anybody submitted uh, through their township trustee, don't panic because I have them and they'll be getting forwarded to the building and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. Wow, we've spent all the money. 
No, um, what we had we're to do going, is we had to come with a, an ending point. To we're see. moving it to the foundation Correct. to manage it. Yeah, Got after. It. So, okay. Yeah, this way we'll know exactly how much we have left available, but mm -hmm. then can go to the foundation to manage. Okay, I see. So this is a temporary stop, a temporary halt, and then we will provide information on how to apply in the future. Hopefully in a f month or so, we'll have more information. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know, know that we've talked to a foundation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe longer. So I think maybe a little longer. All right. Um, anything else for the good of the order? We'll be back next week. We will. It will be September 11th. Um, we don't have any items on our work session. So with that, we are adjourned. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.